class for six years was because her son had a prior conviction called a strike under California law, which entitles me, the next time he commits any felony, to have the judge double his sentence from three years to six years. His prior conviction was killing his own younger brother. So he spent 19 years in prison, came out on parole, and the only place you can go after being in prison 19 years is your mother's house. After three weeks, got into an argument, and he popped her in the eye. You would think she would want me to prosecute the son. Oh, no. Total opposite. She said, Mr. Greenman, I've already lost one son. What you're trying to do is help me lose a second son, and I, and I don't want you to do that. So we're going to find, if we take these cases seriously, that there's going to be a pushback from victims because they're too embarrassed or too afraid. But the point is very clear. We can still get a conviction. We can still prove these cases even when we have victims who are uncooperative or who are putting up a wall of silence. Because this is the bottom line. And this is something that gets me a little bit of friction with well-meaning social workers for whom self-determination is uh, an ideal. We cannot operate with self-determination. We cannot allow victims to choose which cases the AG's office, the US Attorney's office, or my office prosecutes. It doesn't work that way. And yet, too many prosecutors' offices and too many law enforcement allow it to happen. These three words appear in crime reports all over the country today. And this is wrong. This is factually incorrect, but it happens every single day in America. And we have got to do whatever we can to train law enforcement to get rid of this. And, I, and I'm so happy, Jane to, Jane, to hear about this wonderful uh, document you're producing in December about tools to help law enforcement. Because one of the tools, I think, should be that we make it very clear to law enforcement that we don't ever ask victims this question. Because it's not up to victims. Give me an example. A couple of years ago, I was issuing a case where there was a reference to an earlier incident with the same victim and the same defendant in 2008, but there had been no prosecution. And I wanted to know why. My victim advocate found the earlier report. Look what it said. This case, non-prosecutable, will be cancelled as exceptional victim declined to prosecute. There it is. In large, bold font, that's the detective writing there. Now that is inexcusable. That has got to change. But will it change? I don't know. But it's up to us to make sure that locally, your local law enforcement in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine don't fall into this trap. This is a case that the detective brought to me, which I applauded him for. But look what he did. While he was interviewing the victim, he asked the victim, I asked McLean if he wants to press charges. And the victim said yes. So of course, I, I couldn't resist it. I, this was a teaching moment for me, for the detective. I thanked the detective profusely for doing a great investigation, but then I said, detective, there's one thing I have to clear up with you. Why on earth did you ask that question? Do me a favor, I said, don't ever ask that question ever again in any investigation you do for us, because it's not relevant. And factually, it's not correct to do that. But it happens all the time. This is a quote from a police chief in North Carolina. My police officers always respond to calls, treating potential victims with compassion and dignity. Now that's great. We applaud that. But then this is what the chief says. We, the police, charge when the charges are there to be made and if we have a willing victim. What? I mean, you just scored an own goal by saying that. Again, in North Carolina, they talked about 26 cases, suspects were arrested in 12. In three cases, the victim did not press charges. Again, we've got to get rid of this mentality. Look what Rhode Island said in a newspaper article. It was a headline on a Sunday newspaper. Look at that. When I saw that, I mean, I just, I, I really got upset and I called the the Year of Providence Journal, I said, we've got to do something about this because you are giving your readers the wrong impression. It's actually putting victims in Rhode Island in more danger. Because if defendants read this, and if they think it's up to the victim to press charges, you know what defendants will do, don't you? They will threaten, 
they will harass, they will stalk, because that's what my defendants did after they were arrested. What's the first phone call they make? To their mother. Mom, do you realize what you've done? You've, because of your phone call, I've got arrested, they put me in a jail with six other sex offenders in the same cell, I'm not getting any food, I'm being beaten up, you've got to get me out of here, Mum, and you've got to tell that horrible DA that you're going to drop the charges. I hear that all the time. So we've got to put our foot down and say, no, it doesn't happen that way. Because why am I so insistent? Because if we don't prosecute the perpetrator when he rips off the mother, what message are we sending to him? I got away with it. I can do it again. Myth number three. If my victim gives the money voluntarily, they're telling me it's not a crime. How many of you have heard that? Exactly. Just to illustrate this, I, I, mean, I, get, I mean, I'm very fortunate. I get calls and emails from APS from all over the country now because I'm on the board of NAPSA as a criminal justice person. And so they, they contact me, which is great. Um, uh, three years ago, two or three years ago, APS in another part of California contacted me. They were really upset. They said, Greenwood, look at this. So this was the case. A woman went around Modesto convincing elderly women that she was poor and that she needed money to bury a four-year-old boy that had just died, her son. And she took her 10-year-old son with her to make it even more poignant and human. One lady gave her $14,000, money that she could ill afford. The police in Modesto did a fantastic job of investigating, and they submitted the case to the district attorney's office in Modesto. What did the DA do? Reject it. This case got to the news, and the newspaper contacted the DA's office and asked them a very easy question. Why did you reject this case? You know what the DA said? This is the response that was in the article. This is a prosecutor call speaking now. Simply getting scammed by a smooth talking person is no crime. If, no, if money is freely voluntarily given or donated or gifted, there is no theft. What? So you can see that this has to be a training for prosecutors as well. How many of you have had the response? It's just a civil matter. <coughs> Get over it, they tell you. No, it's not just a civil matter. Because what I've learned over 22 years is that things aren't always how they first appear. For example, take this bird. And you look at this bird and go, okay, uh, at first impressions, what is it? Parrot, parakeet, something tropical? Yes. <coughs> But the longer you look at it, you realize it's not a bird. It's a lady, a human being. Some of you can see it already, right? Some of you will never see it. That's okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it. See that? That's her elbow. See that? That's her shoulder. See that? That's her knee. And that's her left toe. Yeah? Okay, good. Why on earth did she agree to be painted and sit on a stump? I don't know. But at least it illustrates my point. Because this is it. What appears on the surface to be consensual, because that's what cops will tell you, but she consented to it. No, you start looking beyond the surface and you say, well, okay, but it's been diluted by out and out lies, misrepresentations, undue influence, or per by taking advantage of the person's uh, cognitive impairment. Here's my victim. There is her late husband on the right, and in the middle is the crook. Victim with Parkinson's becomes a widow. Husband dies suddenly. She says, I don't want to live in the house anymore. It's got too many 
memories of, of my wonderful marriage. I want to leave. I want to sell. So she sells, takes $300,000 with her, and moves into the facility in La Jolla in San Diego where Crook works. Crook knows the victim has come into the facility with $300,000 and he decides, I want that money. One night while she's at dinner, he has the key to every room. He walks into her room and he removes the photograph of husband and wife. <coughs> Scans it into a computer, Adobe photoshops his image, and creates this bogus photograph, this photograph here. He then waits four weeks, and waits until her Parkinson's really gets to the point where she becomes delusional and confused. He sits down with her and he says, I knew it! The moment you walked in, I thought I recognized you, and then he whips it out. Look! He shows her the photo. This is proof. I am your long-lost nephew. He then convinces her that God brought them together. And so he says, wouldn't it be a great idea if you purchased an apartment using all your money, we'll put it into joint names, I'll take care of you, and that will be the best solution. And she agreed to it. An adult son who lived out of town heard about this living arrangement, thought it was suspicious, called San Diego Police Department, and what did they tell him? It's a simple matter. It's not a crime. Go get a lawyer. Well, thankfully, he didn't go get a lawyer. He decided to bring it to our office. And we assigned an, uh, an investigator, and he went over to the apartment, and he found this photo, which was the best evidence to present to a court because this defendant had never, ever met my victim's late husband. This was a fraud. One of the last cases I did was this one. I was amazed at how many older adults in San Diego owned a baby granny. And when you decide to downsize, what's the first thing you get rid of? The baby grand, right? So, where do you get rid of a baby grand? You take it to a very fashionable piano store in La Jolla, which is an upmarket part of San Diego, and you do a contract with the piano store owner, where you agree that if he sells the piano, he will get 35%, and the owner of the piano will get 65%. And so it's a business transaction, right? Well, 19 of these victims all did the same thing, but not one of them received one dollar from the consignment. Every time these people, and they, these victims didn't know each other, they would call up and he would give excuse after excuse. Until finally, two or three of these victims got fed up with this and they concluded, appropriately, this guy has ripped me off. That's a fair conclusion, isn't it? If he doesn't produce the piano, if he doesn't produce money from the sale, you are logically thinking, this guy has ripped me off. So you contact the local police department, do you not? And what do they tell you? It's a civil matter. And in this case, not only did they tell them verbally, one of them got an email. And here it is. This is all a civil issue and the police department would not be able to assist. Basically, go away. Now, I'm not faulting Officer Perigude, but what I'm faulting is the fact that we are expecting in our jurisdictions for police officers every single day to be making legal opinions, and they are not qualified to give this legal opinion. This should never have been done, and this should come from the top. This should come from the police chiefs of every agency. Don't ever write that because you're not a lawyer. You don't know what a civil issue is. You don't know what turns a civil issue into a crime. The only person who can do that is Andrew, or Jamie, or one of the other prosecutors. And so what I had to go around is saying to these uh, agencies, take the facts and give them to me and to my colleagues and let us figure out if it's just a civil matter. So how on earth did I hear about this case? Because the police would never call me up and say, hey, Paul, I just rejected the case because it's a civil matter. They never do that. How did I hear about it? By this. Happen again. This guy got a written contract when he put an 80-year-old piano on consignment at a local store. When it sold, he was supposed to get 60%. Now, he says he thought everything was fine, so he just didn't worry about it. But before he knew it, five years had gone by, and he says, now the piano is missing in action. So that's how I heard about it. So I called up the TV reporter, 
And I said, hey, can you come to my office and give me some information? And he was happy to do that because it was Sweeps Week. And it was an exclusive, you know, that they could brag on the, on the TV the next night that by what they did, they now broke this case open. It was one of the easiest cases I've ever prosecuted. 38 counts, 19 victims. I did 19 counts of embezzlement, 19 counts of elder financial exploitation. We did a probable cause hearing. Out of 19 victims, 13 showed up. Yeah, you guessed it. Three had medical issues and the other three were on cruises. You got it, exactly. But after 13 victims told the identical same story, of course, what did he do? He pled. Powers of attorney. So often the suspect has power of attorney, do they not? And it's a weapon. They use it effectively against the victim. They use it to benefit themselves. Adult Protective Services gets involved, they do a cross-report to local law enforcement. The 25-year-old police officer comes up and the first person they meet is the suspect. What does the suspect do? They brandish a power of attorney. Officer, I don't know why you're wasting your time. I have power of attorney. Oh, okay, power of attorney, fine. Okay, thank you, goodbye. No, there's a misunderstanding here. Powers of attorney don't give you the right to steal. Nor should the suspect be able to claim well, I'm going to inherit anyway, so what's the big deal? No, that doesn't work. What about if we discover the theft after the victim is already dead? And that happens a lot. <coughs> the typical response from law enforcement is what? Well, if the victim of theft is dead, there's nothing we can do. That's the typical response in San Diego, if it was. We had to learn that we can still, in some cases, Prove beyond reasonable doubt theft, even when the victim is already dead. For example, forgery. Do we need the victim alive to prove forgery? No, we don't. Because we have known handwriting samples of the victim, we can compare those to the forged document, and we can allege that, obviously, because it's a forgery, then there was no consent. Or the victim who lacks the ability to give consent. You remember I did my opening statement this morning with you, with my victim, Ruth White? Remember, I, I told you as jurors, you will never ever meet the victim. She never testified. Did I need her? No. How could I prove lack of consent? I brought in her doctor to prove that she had advanced Alzheimer's and that when she signed that CD certificate, she did not have the ability to give <coughs> consent. So when police officers tell me that they can't investigate because the victim of theft is dead, you know what my response is? Officer, what would you do if I wanted to report a murder? <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, I can't take a report. Why not? Because the victim's dead? No, it doesn't work that way, okay? Right. And what about home repair fraud? Do you have cases of that in the tri-states? Of course you do. But the trouble is, in many jurisdictions, it's considered to be a civil matter. Why? Because the suspect contractor has engaged in a written contract with the victim, and as a result, it's now classified as a business transaction. But it's not. It's a, it's a crime, and we need to be able to prosecute it as such. For example, I always start by asking, well, is this guy qualified to do the work? He says he's a roofer, but does he have a license to do that? Secondly, has he ripped off anybody else? One of my favorite things to do when we had law students working for the summer, I would get a case in of one of these contract fraud cases with one victim, and I would call in the law student, I would love to do this, and I'd say, okay, this is your assignment. And they would think that I'm about to give them research, you know, for a case law, oh, this is gonna be good. Oh no, I want you within the next 48 hours, find me three more victims. And they go, um, uh, I, I, sorry, I hadn't trained to do that in high school. I said, no, that's why you're here. But, but how do I find three more victims? I said, three places. Number one, I want you to contact the Better Business Bureau. Because I've learned over 22 years, the victims of financial elder abuse, particularly of this contractor fraud, they don't call the police, but they do contact the Better Business Bureau, because they're mad and there's complaints against suspect contractors in every BBB. 
Secondly, I want you to go downstairs to the third floor and go to the civil court office. And I want you to type in the name of the suspect and to see if he's ever been sued as a civil defendant in a breach of contract case. And thirdly, I want you to contact the Contractors State License Board to see if they've ever had any complaints against this guy. And when they do that, they come back and they, I, we still have it, they say, Mr. Freeman, you asked me for three more victims. Yes, I did. I've got seven. It's <gasps> great. great. But victims have written to me in the past, and this is one victim who took the time to explain what happened to him. They, the crooks, worked for a month. But the one was sprayed. I called and complained. I spoke to him and his wife. They kept making excuses. They finally stopped coming, changed their phone numbers. I paid them 26 grand. In addition, they rented a U-Haul, and now my belongings are missing $11,000 worth. I called the police, but they said it was a civil matter. One of my first cases involved this. I love this. If you're a crook, this is what you call yourself. Look at that. Father and daughter's Christian construction company. We will do anything from cleaning a toilet to building a house. This is a flyer that we created. Where would you put this? Church. Church parking lot, right? On a Sunday morning, during the 10 a.m. worship service, you show up as a crook at 10.15, and you put it on certain vehicles. The vehicle that you do not put it on is the F-150 pickup. <laughs> the vehicle you do put it on is the Buick. <laughs> It's the 1985 Buick Century. And you're going to get somebody. Here's one of my victims. She fell for it. She came out of church, saw the flyer. She had a Buick. She contacted the guy. He came over the next day. He got her to sign a contract. Look at this contract. Is it professional? Of course not. Does it have spelling mistakes? Yeah. And my mother was one. Because she was an English high school teacher, she said, if you see spelling mistakes, they were probably done by a crook. So I use spelling mistakes as circumstantial evidence of dishonesty. <laughs> and there is no what we call consideration in this contract. In every contract of law, you need what is called a price, consideration. There is no agreed price. All he says is, just work with me. <laughs> That's too vague. <laughs> for a contract. So this is illegal anyway. But he's a rip-off guy. Inside her kitchen, he gets her to write out a check for $1,300. She thinks that's for the full price. He takes her to the bank. The bank is suspicious at 9.30 in the morning. And so they, they call her. They call her. But she says, no, it's fine. He's got his workmen here. They're doing the work. Give him the money. Fast forward to 4 p.m. My victim is distraught. She realizes she hired the wrong guys. Not only have they not done the work, they've actually damaged some of her property. But you're 86, you're a widow, you don't want to confront these guys. You're, you're willing to lose $1,300. And just as long as they leave, it gets worse. At four o'clock, he comes back into the kitchen with his cronies, and he says, get out your checkbook. She says, but I paid you this morning. Ah, he says, that was just for materials. You owe me another $4,200. She says, and right then she realizes this is not just bad women, these are crooks. Well, what do you do when you're 86 and you're all alone? She was very calm and very logical. She thought, I'll write out the check, they'll leave. On the, uh, while they're driving to the bank, I'll call the bank and put a stop on the check. And then I'll call 911 and have the police come and protect me because I know that they will be very angry with me when they can't get their money and they'll be coming back. So I need to be protected. Well, it got worse. William Petrie grabbed the check. He says to the three cronies, stay here, because he knows what the bank will do. Sure enough, he gets to the bank at 4.15, they call her again. But this time, totally different demeanor. She's shaking, she's hesitant, because these three guys are staring her down. She's very fearful, and, but reluctantly she says, pay him. So very, very reluctantly, the teller gives him the money, and then he drives back to the house, picks up the cronies, and off they go. Imagine that happening today in your jurisdiction, and it could well be happening. I'll tell you what she does. She sits at the kitchen table, the phone is right there, she's crying, and she, what do you think, who do you think she calls? I'll tell you. She calls nobody. Why not? 
You know the answer. She's what? She's afraid of these guys, and also she's embarrassed. She doesn't want her kids to find out. So how on earth do I find out? Because this is a case where it worked as a team. Because what did the bank teller do? The bank teller knew that there was something was wrong, right? So what did the bank teller do? Who did she call? She either, well, she called the adult care services. What did they do? They went out 48 hours later, sat in the kitchen with my victim, and she confides in the APS. What do APS do? They cross-report to local law enforcement. What do local law enforcement do? They do a fantastic investigation, and they bring it to my office, and then I get to prosecute William Petrie. But I don't just prosecute him for elder financial abuse, because this is where I salivate over these cases, you know? Because where did the crime occur? In our house. I can charge him with residential burglary because California's statute does not require breaking and entering. It just requires him to enter the premises with the intent to rip her off. That's all it says. Well, it doesn't say rip her off. <laughs> but that's what I always use for jurors. But, because they understand that. It says with the intent to permanently deprive. That doesn't sound as good. Rip it off. So I can charge him with two counts of residential burglary because he went in in the morning and, and in the afternoon. And then I charged him with one count of robbery because when he's standing over her in the afternoon, she doesn't want to write out this check. Why does she write it out? Because she is in fear. And that's what one of the elements of robbery is. When you take money belonging to somebody else through force or through fear. One of my very last cases, and I'm hoping that your consumer protection office will have a watch out for this company. They're the worst garage door company in the country, and they're probably operating in Vermont. They go under the name of garage door services. They are absolute villains, but they're licensed, they're, they're legitimate in Dallas, Texas, and they have technicians in every state. And what, what's their MO? They train their technicians to upsell products that are not needed. One of the best pieces of evidence that I used in this case was video from the training that was smuggled out by a discontented salesman who didn't want any part of this. And we had that video showing how these salesmen were being trained to upsell. I had a couple of elderly uh, homeowners with Buicks who would charge $4,000 for a simple repair of their garage. So, um, very quickly, um, the last 10 minutes. Minute number seven. Have you ever heard this said? Well, the crime didn't occur here. So it's none of our, go, go talk to another somebody else. It's none of our business. No, we don't, we're not dealing with this. Uh -uh. The crime typically occurs where the email, the letter, where the phone call came in. Where they came in, that's where the crime occurred. Where the victim lives. So if your victim lives here, and the victim got scammed here, that's where the crime occurred. And one of the things I'm really excited about is this fantastic program, thanks to the 2017 Federal Act that uh, Andrew is now part of, this Elder Justice Coordination. Because if you get something like this in Vermont, you can reach out to Andrew, because he's got the power of the feds behind him. He can reach out to all kinds of people. And even if the suspect is out of state, out of country, maybe, just maybe, the US Attorney's Office, with other victims out there, will be able to do something about this case. So I got an email from a Catholic priest who had been scammed by the Publishers Clearinghouse scam, and he lost $41,000. And I knew that if I gave it to the police, they wouldn't be able to do anything with it, so my office agreed that we could investigate it. And so we did a search warrant on Wells Fargo because fortunately my priest had wired the money through Wells Fargo. And we located the suspect in Greenville, South Carolina. And the great thing was that uh, he has noticeable tattoos on his neck. He opened up a fraudulent bank account with a fraudulent social security, so we didn't know who he really was. All we knew was what he looked like. And so my investigator sent this photo to every single law enforcement agency within a 50 mile radius of Greenville. And bingo, somebody recognized him and they gave it all his details. He'd just been booked on a drugs offense. And so we extradited him 
from the East Coast. And then I wanted my priest, well, I appointed my priest, but he was my victim priest, to do his public service announcement. He said, no. I asked him the next week, no. Keep asking, eventually. Well, I, I got a letter from a, a publisher's clearing house one day, and it says, congratulations, uh, you won uh, $6 million. I couldn't believe it, but I was familiar with the, uh, the publishing clearing house. So we show this to seniors, and you know what? It's one thing for me to say, but for a Catholic priest to tell them his story, that really impacts them. Because they realize, if it can happen to my priest, it can happen to me. So, as I wrap up in the last few minutes, um, they're calling it now officially a US public health concern. No surprise to you, we are going to see an explosion of these cases over the next 10 years. And that's why we've got to beef up our response through law enforcement, through prosecution. This graphic it reminds me of who is out there trying to get hold of the life savings of so many of your victims. And it's going to get worse. We know that. And there are so many articles out there, and it's saying one thing. I am frustrated. It says that. So many victims feel that they're not getting justice. Why do we constantly hear that few cases are prosecuted? Look at this article that appeared in Forbes magazine last month. Frustration for families. Law enforcement isn't pursuing financial elder abuses. One of the reasons is because of this. Now hear me out. Most prosecutors will tell you that cases of elder abuse are hard to prosecute. There are some cases are hard, but I can tell you from over 750 felony cases that I've prosecuted, the majority were not hard to prosecute because of Agnes and other victims. They're not hard. They, we, we come up with excuses why they're hard. And this article explains this. There was a private elder law attorney who was so frustrated, she said, that so many senior citizens have fallen victims to fraud, abuse, or neglect. None of these cases have made their way to the prosecution. Nothing ever happens to these people, she said. You steal from one, and you move on to the next. People are sitting ducks. So the journalist went to the elected district attorney in that jurisdiction and said, what do you say about it? And this is what his comment was. Many suspects haven't been arrested and prosecuted because there is no proof. Do you accept that? He went on to say there's been talk and reports, but not one case has been charged or indicted because we haven't had evidence. To me, that is a lame excuse to explain why his office has not prosecuted elder financial exploitation. Of course there is proof. In any case, of course there is evidence. And whether it rises to the level of beyond reasonable doubt is another matter. But there are always going to be some evidence, isn't there? It reminded me of this ad that I saw in O'Hare Airport. <laughs> and instead of saying the word opportunities, strike that out and put the word evidence. You can't see evidence if you're not willing to look for it, right? And I love this guy here. He's really committed. Look at that guy. <laughs> but that's, that's the problem with so many elected prosecutors in this country right now. Their heads are firmly in the sand. And they either say, we don't have this problem, or they say, we don't have the resources. They say it's too time consuming. They will give you every excuse. Or they'll say, those cases are too challenging because elderly people are confused, they're demented. It's, it's an excuse. That's all I can tell you. It's an absolute excuse. And APS gets very frustrated. And they send me emails. And they say, not only are we struggling to get the prosecutors to charge, but now they're dismissing when civil matters are involved. So they're very unhappy. So I do have um, an outline of all I, that I wanted to share with you. And I, what I'm going to do, Tori, if it's okay with you, I'll, um, I'll stri uh, sort of strip it down without the photos. But I'll, can I pass them on to you? And then we can upload it and share it. Because obviously I'm not going to get through everything in the last few minutes. But what I want to do is this. I want to uh, just pass, fast forward. Because what I've learned over these 22 years, and you can see there's quite a bit here that I haven't done, 